What I want to do is, to part, I think quite a few people are mentioning Mathematica today, so I want to really set out more of a vision of where we see it go, the technology going as much as showing some of the things that are available now. So our, our vision is to use real tools in education. So we don't make educational tools. We make tools that people use for real work, and then we are looking to try and find ways to apply those um, within educational contexts. So another philosophy that we have is everyone develops, everyone uses. I think that uh, fits very well with uh, what Scott was saying about learn by making. It's what you do in the workplace or in science, and it's, it's a great way within education. We're also trying to mix computation with knowledge. So we're trying to not just have maths as a computable thing, but also uh, ideas and, uh, and methods and data all fit in with that. And the big question is how? Well, our big approach is automate everything, automate as much as we can. Now, I was going to show some stuff in Mathematica here, but uh, thanks to Conrad Wolfram for discovering for me that the network has a firewall blocking uh, Mathematica from speaking to the outside world, so I'll, I'll run this in a browser. So here's, I think, the example that Conrad was trying to do, and one of these automations is to try and automate linguistics, so having fuzzy inputs that, uh, that aren't necessarily syntactically correct or in Mathematica programming notation, and try and uh, make some use of those. And at this stage, we're, I think, pretty much at the point where everything that you could do as a computation, something you might name as a, as a step in school or even undergraduate level, uh, uh, can be done in an automated way. So um, let's, um, oops, that's not what I wanted at all. So here's something that uh, I was made to learn is uh, expand sine of, uh, sine of a double angle rule and um, and hopefully we get back here that it's two sine cos t. But because we make real tools for real people, we're not focused on those sort of educational examples. So if I wanted to say what's the 52 angle rule, then that's, it's just an extension of the same idea. And if we focus on making educational examples, then we always end up building in, in limits. So I said knowledge as well. So knowledge isn't just computation. It's about knowing all of these different tricks and rules and models and things. So if I say something like uh, the cosine rule, with some triangle that's got angle sides 40, 50, and 60 degrees. It'll try and interpret that, and it knows the cosine rule, even though that's just one of those many formulas that used to be on formula sheets or you had to learn. And here it's telling me interesting things about this triangle that I've just given the values to. So it's kind of trying to match knowledge against the numbers, and then doing a computation with it, which involves uh, solving the cosine rule equation for various different um, parameters. But we take that idea further to things that you don't think of so much mathematical, like, uh, say, column buckling. In the end, there's a lot of these things have either formulas or methods behind them. I haven't given this enough to actually work it out, so it's filled in some values that I might provide. And here's the critical buckling load on a column that's got those parameters to it. And our sort of longer-term vision is to take all of that kind of knowledge, and as we move into things like uh, systems modeling, where models for, you know, engineers are working out models for how the uh, the Ford Escort's gearbox works. We'd like to see all of these kinds of things or the open models for how the body works available. So I should be able to say, you know, what's the reaction of the heart if I put in adrenaline going up at a certain formulaic rate? Um, we're not uh, there for that yet for quite a while, but in the end, all of these things are just extensions of the same idea as grabbing the cosine rule. Just a little bit more complicated what's going on behind the scenes. So part of that knowledge is also about data. I can ask all kinds of obscure, obscure things. Um, so let's say Turkey's in France and uh, we'll get some data on, on that, and there's thousands of data sets. But again, the, the key thing here is we're trying to do real data. And so I hate these sort of uh, educational things where it's like, imagine that the following is data for some data set. What would be the mean? Well, let's give them real data. And I have this vision where you can say to a bunch of kids, go and get the data.gov data and find something interesting about it and write your own press release for the Daily Mail because their journalists can't figure this stuff out for themselves. And then there's also overlaying computation directly on data as well. So I could say something like um, average uh, temperature, uh, Berlin, um, 1920 to, uh, what are we on, 2011. And there we're getting data. In this case, I'm grabbing it directly from the weather station. But then I'm overlaying some simple computation, like um, smoothing it out so that we don't get these annual cycles. And uh, um, I guess we could probably post this one on the global warming denier site. There's no real trend there, is there? So the next thing is, is trying to make content that you can drive. And uh, we saw this morning somebody showing how multidimensional data is really hard to interpret. And being able to drive how you slice through that um, is, is 
is really important because you can't visualize anything beyond about three or four dimensions. Once you've got a 3D plot and some uh, animation, and maybe some colors on it, then you're up to about four or five dimensions. But here we've got something that is uh, essentially a sort of 10 dimensional input because I've got some hidden inputs down here. And the idea is that I can, I can interact with that. And this is a model from insurance. What's the optimal insurance characteristics depending on how much risk we want to take and how much money we've got to lose and so on. And being able to drive that without having to go into all of the equations and, uh, and code them or put in values, but just be able to in, in, interact with is a very important, more constrained form of interaction with knowledge. So that leads us into um, one of our other projects, which is to try and uh, make it so that there is a great resource of these things. The whole point about packaging things up so you don't need to they, know how they work is so that you can then share them with people without having to be experts in them. And um, you can explore this to the demonstration site at your leisure, but um, I'll draw two things to attention. One is uh, this remarkable number that we've got it without having to spend any money on it, which is great. And the reason is because we've automated the construction of these things, and there needs to be more work in automation. We want to bring linguistics to automating as well um, so that you can do this completely without programming. The other thing I wanted to draw attention to is some of the slightly... So a lot of these things are created by software developers and teachers, but there's also a stream of these things. And if I grab this one here that I, I like as an example, it's not because it's a especially interesting example. It's um, here's the size of a shadow as the person walks to and from the light. But this came from a, a teacher who uses creating demonstrations as an, as an exercise for her class in order to figure out if they really understand stuff. So they make demonstrations and submit them to this project as part of their activities. And so here's three students from Torrey Pines High School that created this demonstration. So our vision here is to try and make citizen authoring so that there's plenty of people who could write a technical report or even a, uh, quite a few people who can write textbooks, but very often they can't then make them interactive, that they need programmers to get involved to, to make that, that possible. So this wasn't enough for us as well. We needed not just to have these sort of little apps, but we want to have a full kind of set of narrative. And for that, we've been creating this document format that the idea is to bring together all of that um, document history that we have to make things look the way we want and present them to humans together with the interactivity. Um, lots of examples. I will show just one here. Let's go for textbooks. Um, and this is going to run in the browser, but I think I'm going to show it in its full form here. Let's just open the whole thing up. So here is a, a chapter out of the Briggs Cochrane uh, calculus book, fairly traditional looking calculus book. But uh, in amongst all of this nicely presented narrative, there's also interactivity. For us, our vision is there's no difference between document and application. They're just shades of gray between, depending on how much interactivity versus how much text there is. So one of the key things about this citizen authoring is to make it easy. Here's the example Conrad tried to do within Mathematica. It returns not just the answer that I asked for, but it also tries to return this sort of formal Mathematica language version. So I'm going to try and make this into an interactive version. And I'll just grab that as the suggested syntax. And I'm going to say I want an interactive interface. And then we want to say we're going to have some frequency that we can change going from um, 10 to 20. And we'll need to say what the frequency does. So our aim then is to automate the whole construction. So the on event action and all the stuff programmers care about, that's just done automatically. It's put a slider on it. We can interact with it. And it's only through this kind of thing that it's easy enough that these 7,000 odd people have been able to make all that content. And we want even kind of slightly trickier things that uh, work just as easily. So I'll just do one more example like this. I'm uh, grab, is that going to be Right, so I hadn't anticipated how dark you all were going to be. So I think it will point this at me. And I'm going to do something live with this uh, stream that I'm inputting. Um, okay, let me finish this one and then I'll wrap up. So we'll do the same kind of thing as before. We'll have an interface here, and then we'll have um, some function that we'll do to this thing. Well, I don't know what it is yet. A function and a parameter. I should give them proper names, of course. And we'll have the function being some choice out of uh, blur, edge detect. Now, of course, you don't tend to think of uh, image processing as being maths, but in the end, most of it's just linear algebra. And so it should be just as accessible as solving some simultaneous equations. And then we'll have the n going from 0 to 20. So I've done exactly as before. It may not be that every teacher can do this kind of thing, but it's within the realms of lots of people. And now I've got something where I can see what happens if we blur it, and we can do the edge detection. Oop, I'm over here. 
and opening some weird morphological construct that tries to close, open up the dark areas. So this stuff should just work. So in the end for us, it's not educational software, it's one level computation, and then it's interfaces for different purposes. Whether you want to have open stuff where it's free form to explore, or closed like these manipulates, whether it's for a beginner, you might want uh, linguistic stuff, for experts, you might uh, want language, precise and fuzzy, do we want something useful said, or do we want to say no if you've got it wrong? They're all just interface choices. And I guess I'll stop there, since otherwise we'll have no coffee. Thank you.